We were opening up yesterday the understanding that Jesus redeemed power itself, the stuff that leaders have to handle. And as we said, it's exhilarating stuff to use, but very dangerous of its worldly power. Jesus redeemed power, and there flows for us from the cross an entirely different kind of power than the power that's operating in the world. The second thing that Jesus introduced was a new style of leader. And it's important that these two go together because I believe only the new kind of leader can ever understand redeemed power. The, the uh, n n I was going to say normal, the ordinary kind of leader can understand redeemed power because it will not do for him what he wants to be done. So the two have to go together. And Jesus has introduced in his own person a leader who has these two characteristics. Number one, he is a servant by nature. We'll come to that later. Servant nature. And number two, he's got beyond the status syndrome. Now turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20. Matthew 20 and verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to him. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right hand or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. I want you to understand the context of this passage in Matthew's Gospel. It seems that one day James and John were speaking together, and the subject came up about the kingdom because Jesus was always talking about the kingdom. And James said to John, you understand when the kingdom comes into, into being, there are going to be two very powerful positions up for grabs, one at Jesus' right hand and one at Jesus' left. And John said, well, we better get our application in smartly. And James said, well, who are we going to get to recommend us? And John said, what about mum? So they get mum to present their case for these two slots. Matthew says the other ten disciples were indignant at this. Why were they indignant? Well, James and John had obviously upstaged them. They had their sights on the same two jobs, you see. And in that context, Jesus makes this statement, and no leader I know has ever taken this seriously. He said, the one who wants to be first amongst you must be your slave. The one who is great amongst you must be your servant. Now, <clears throat> any leader worth his salt said, well, that's ridiculous. If the leader is going to be a servant, who on earth is going to lead? And I don't think the church has ever really heard this, or certainly hasn't taken it seriously, the way it's meant to be taken seriously. We are much more comfortable, actually, with, with Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17, verse 7. Jesus said, suppose one of you had a servant plowing and looking after the sheep. Would he say to the servant when he comes, comes in from the field, come along now, sit down to eat? Would you not rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? I mean, that's better, isn't it? There's a master who knows his place and a servant who knows his place. We're much more familiar with that. This business about the leader being the servant, what does all that mean? Jesus instituted <coughs> in his own person this whole understanding of the leader who is a servant. Now, when we're talking about servant leadership, 
we have to understand three, three or four very important things. Firstly, servanthood refers to the leader's nature, not his activities. It's not the leader who is going around doing servant things. It's the leader whose character, whose nature, whose motivation is that of a servant. Some people serve willingly on the way up. They are, as it were, paying their dues. But their aim is one day they get to a place of leadership when they don't serve other people anymore. Now people serve them. That's not what we're talking about. Some leaders get involved very heavily in all manner of serving activities simply because they do not know how to delegate. And they can't trust other people to do, do the job properly. So they do it all themselves. They end up complaining about how hard they work and how badly they treat. I'm not talking about that. <coughs> some, some leaders do servant things, but their real aim, if you look at it, is to make themselves indispensable. So they get involved in everything. And if you're, dis you're indispensable, you wield an awful lot of power. Because even the threat of withdrawing your services from a strategic point will enable you to get your will done very easily. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the leader whose nature, whose character is a servant, not the things he does, okay? Secondly, servanthood refers to character and motivation, not leadership style. Now, there are a number of identifiable uh, leadership styles that are often, often uh, taught about and, and uh, practiced, for that matter. They range all the way from he very heavy, hands-on, top-down uh, kind of leadership to the more participative, democratic, uh, cooperative style of lead leadership. I'm not talking about that. In actual fact, you can have a very top-down, uh, hands-on leadership that comes out of a true servant heart. Or you can, you can find that style of leadership that is totally dominant, dominating. You can find a participative, uh, sharing type of leadership that when you look at it closely, it's, it's intensely manipulative. It's just the leader finds that's the best way uh, to, to uh, get his will done, to do it indirectly rather than directly. I'm not talking about that. In fact, uh, generally it's held that both styles of leadership have their rightful place. And broadly, if things are going very well, people are content with a very directive leadership. If things are in crisis point, similarly the directive leadership does best. So there's going to be a rescue operation of somebody who has to step in and take responsibility, make the decisions, call the shots. In between those, in the intervening stages, probably the participative style of leadership generally does better. But what I want to emphasize is that those can come either out of a servant heart or out of a natural desire to dominate or to, to, uh, to get your will done. I'm not talking about leadership style. Okay? Thirdly, servanthood refers to nature, not role. One of the marks of a, of a servant leader is that you can give him leadership, he remains a servant. You can take leadership from him, he remains a servant. His basic motivation is a desire to serve. If in a situation he discovers that the best way he can serve people is by leading them, then he will lead. But if somebody comes along who obviously can lead better than he can, he will very happily hand over leadership because basically all he wants to do is, is to serve you find some other way of serving. That's what Jesus is talking about. The leader who is by character, by nature, by motivation, a person who wants to serve. Now the primary biblical model of the leader is that of the shepherd. 
because essentially the shepherd is there for the sake of the sheep and not the other way around. And here are some characteristics that I believe exemplify the essence of servanthood as far as leaders are concerned. Number one, the paramount aim of the servant leader is the best interests of those he leads. The paramount aim of the servant leader is the best interests of those he leads. That requires that leaders know their people. You cannot serve people unless you know them. And I want us to reflect just a few minutes on this whole business of how leaders know their people. The knowledge of, pe knowledge of persons is by no means self-evident. If it was self-evident, we wouldn't have half the, wouldn't have half the problems we do with it. Yes. Not a simple thing to know a person. Here are some of the important points for you to reflect on as far as uh, knowing people are concerned. Number one, we know with our spirit. There's a very interesting verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You can't understand 1 Corinthians 12 unless you master 1 Corinthians 2 first. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 is talking about revelation. And in verse 11 it says, Who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know what God has freely given us. In other words, you know with your spirit. You do not know with your mind. You understand or misunderstand with your mind. You know with your spirit. And the knowledge of persons is, is uh, uh, attained by touching that person in their spirit with your spirit. So we need to know how to reach out in our spirit to people. Now sometimes it happens. Uh, you've all uh, had experience of times when you've met somebody who's been a total stranger to you and in less than uh, 15 seconds you get a very clear, distinct impression of, of the essential nature character of that, of that person. Is that right? You, you Somehow you know them. You can be with another person for years and years and years, work with them five days a week, uh, 50 weeks in a year, and never know them. I think uh, while I'm speaking about a brother in the church in New Zealand I belong to, I've known that man uh, in uh, ordinary human terms, I suppose, for 15 years. I travelled in a carpool with him for about five years to work an hour in the morning and back an hour in, 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 the, in the evening. I do not know the man. I've tried my best. He's just, he just, he just a closed book. Uh, but the only way we'll ever, we'll ever accomplish that is by learning to live out of our spirit towards people. Let me just show you something uh, in that. When we're talking about body, soul and spirit... We often draw concentric circles, body, soul, spirit. And that is the way that most of us actually live. So our first impression, our first uh, experience of a person is a physical and a mental perception. We see them or we hear them, whatever. The second thing generally is there is a certain emotional response, good or bad. And finally, something registers in our, in our, in our, in our spirit. You get a, a sense of the kind of person that's, uh, that's there. For example, if this is somebody that you had an argument with last week and you lost the argument because you didn't remember what to say until it was too late, now today I see the same person. The first thing is I see him the second thing is the memory of that past encounter. My emotions kind of flare out of, out, out of control. Then my conscience, which is in my spirit, is likely to convict me and say, you sure ought not to feel like that about that man. He is your brother in Christ or whatever. Now it's very difficult for our spirit to handle our emotions that are already flaring out of control. The point I want to make is that Jesus did not live like that. I want to show you how Jesus lived. 
Jesus lived spirit, soul, body. In other words, his first perception of anything or anybody was a spiritual perception. Let me give you some examples. Remember the Gospels when Jesus out in the wilderness and a great crowd stream out to hear him. This is what it says. It says, he saw them downcast and distressed like sheep without a shepherd. That's a spiritual perception. He saw them downcast and distressed as sheep without a shepherd. And out of that perception, he was moved with compassion towards them and he taught them many things. Understand the sequence? First, a spiritual perception. Secondly, the emotional reaction that's appropriate to that perception. Thirdly, the behavior that's motivated by the, by the, by the emotions. I'll give you another, another example. Jesus goes into the synagogue. There's a man there with a withered hand. And Jesus looks around about them, uh, on, about himself, and says, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day, to save a life or to kill? And if you read the story, nobody answers him. You might think, Well, they didn't know. You know what it says? He looked around about them with anger, being grieved at the hardness of their hearts. It's a spiritual perception. He said to the man, come out here, stick your hand out, healed him on the spot. He said, put that in your pipe and smoke it, or whatever. See, There was a spiritual perception. Jesus is up on the Mount of Olives at, in Passion Week, and he's looking down over the city, over Jerusalem. And a spirit of prophecy comes on him. And he begins to weep. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stone the prophets and kill all I send to you. It was a spiritual perception. In other words, if we're going to know people, we've got to learn to live with our spirit out front. Uh, I remember speaking to some university students in New Zealand about this years ago. A young woman came up to me afterwards and said, look, what you're talking about is ridiculous. You, sh you couldn't live like that towards everybody. You get hurt too much. Well, you will get hurt from time to time because what you're offering people is your real self, see? Most times we don't do that, we just project an image. But we think we'll be acceptable. People reject the image, well, no sweat, I can find another image, try that, see. But when we reach out in your spirit and you're in, in the approach, see, you're, you're, you're exposed. But that's the, uh, that's the beginnings, the only way to really know people. And we've got to learn to live, I believe, the way Jesus lived. When you do, from time to time, you will get some surprising responses. You find somebody is furiously angry, and yet, if you listen, you find underneath the anger, there's real fear. You know, the man's angry because that's a protective mechanism because he's afraid. And your response is likely to be compassion rather than defensive anger. In other words, you'll read the situation much more accurately. That, however, is, is, not, is only part of the picture. We can reach out all you like towards some people, like the brother I was talking about, and yet never get to know them. In the book of Job, there's a verse that says, Can a man by searching find out God? Answer, no, he can't. We'll never know God unless God reveals himself to us. Can a man by searching find out his wife? No, he can't. He will never know her unless he reveals herself to him. Can a leader by searching find out his people? No, he can't. He will never know his people unless his people reveal themselves to him. So the other side of the coin to reaching out with our spirit is self-disclosure. You will never know your people unless they show themselves to you. Now you can't compel that. And we have to respect people's privacy and people's moral integrity. God does, see. I think one of the tragedies of, of uh, our life as Christians very often is that we, we reach out towards somebody who's in need or somebody we've got a burden for and we knock on the door of their heart and nobody answers and we knock again and nobody answers. Knock again, nobody answers, so we go off somewhere else. And the person opens the door and there's nobody there. You know what it says about Jesus? He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock and knock and knock and knock. Did it for years with us, didn't he? Knock. So one day we opened the door and there he was, see. So we have to create a climate within which people will feel safe to disclose their real self to us. Self-disclosure. Third. Discernment. Let me, let me add something here about this business of, of openness, however. 
You will never lead people unless you know them. You will never know them unless they reveal themselves to you. They will never reveal themselves to you unless they trust you. This self-disclosure requires that we build an atmosphere where people can trust us and trust now, themselves enough to be open to reveal themselves. So you will never, they will never disclose themselves to you unless they trust you. They will never trust you unless they know you. People don't trust strangers. See. They will never know you unless you are open to them. You understand? And I say that because many times, particularly in church, the least open person in the whole organization is the leader, see. He encourages people to be open with him, but he's dead closed as far as uh, openness towards other people are concerned. We have to take the same risk with other people we expect them to take with us, see, if you really got to know them. See. There has to be vulnerability on both sides. So openness is critical. Thirdly, there's this business of discernment. In other words, even when the, even when the message is, is received, it's possible for us to make mistakes. Have you ever had an experience of, of meeting somebody and after a while you... You thought, what a, what a stuck-up character he is. And then when you got to know them better, he doesn't not really like that at all. What was, what was wrong? Well, you just made a mistake. You just read the message wrong. See. Read the message right requires discernment. Now, again, what do we mean by discernment? When I went to school years ago, uh, in English, we used to have to read a lot of the English classics, Dickens and Thackeray and Walter Scott and Jane Austen, all those people. The educational theory was this. If you read enough good literature, you get a deposit in your mind as to what good writing is like. So when you read that story, that article, you've got some basis on which to make a judgment of whether that's good writing or not. That's discernment. How do you discern? Same with music. A musician gets educated ears. So he's listened to so much good music, he's got a deposit somewhere in the back of his mind. He can tell with that tune whether that's music or not. The artist the same. See? How do you discern people? In exactly the same way. Exactly the same way. In other words, we need to learn, I believe, to be far more reflective about our own inner states. Because that, that's the deposit of, of living life, the interior life of a person, that's the only basis on, upon which I can judge other people. For example, I know when I strike somebody who at bottom is grieving over something because I've been through that. What's more, I've observed myself in that state. See, I've learned from it. There's a deposit there. Most times we, we waste, I think, the many of the experiences go through, we go through because we want to put them behind our back, get over it, and get on with life. And we've lost all that stuff there, see? We need to learn to go back through that thing, see? I know when I strike somebody who's afraid because I know, I know what fear feels like, see? Or somebody who was angry, I know the taste of anger. See, I understand what I'm saying? No. That's why older people ought to be better at reading other people than the younger people, but many times they're not, because they haven't made use of the experience they've lived through. See. And we need, I think, to be much more uh, reflective about uh, the things we go through and realize that is building up my discernment of what a person's inner life is like so I can read other people when they disclose themselves to me much more accurately. That's discernment. On top of that, from time to time, the Holy Spirit may give us a supernatural gift of discernment. But as we said uh, yesterday, natural gifts and supernatural gifts are a continuum. They flow together, not two separate boxes. And I suspect that it's only when we're working hard at our natural capacities to discern, from time to time, God will add the supernatural dimension to that when it's needed. Fourthly, we need imagination. In other words, to understand people, we need to some extent to be able to stand in their shoes, uh, imagine ourselves in their frame of reference, and see, see the situation from where they stand. And people without that capacity for imagination uh, often make gross misjudgments of people just because they're, they're reading it from a wrong perspective. And when it comes to uh, stepping across the gender difference, stepping across the racial difference, stepping across the age difference. Uh, we need to have that imaginative capacity to enter the other person's frame of reference and see it from, from their point of view. 
Now, the point I want to make out of all this is that as far as leadership is concerned, if you want to serve people, if there's a true servant heart, the paramount concern of the leader is the best interests of those you serve. If you're going to serve their best interests, you've got to know them. It's not a waste of time to know them. Secondly, the paramount satisfaction of the servant leader is the growth and development of the people he leads. Now, the paramount satisfaction of the natural leader is his own fulfillment, his uh, goal achievement, the success in his career, the success in his ministry or whatever. The servant leader's paramount satisfaction is in the growth and the development of others. Paul expresses it many, many times. Death works in me, he says, but life in you. Now, it's very important because, you see, many, many times... Leaders share with their followers what they know, but only up to a certain point. See, they make sure that somehow they're always a step ahead of the people they're leading, because that's, that, uh, uh, that difference, that space, gives them their authority, gives them their lead. See. And so the people can never develop further than their leaders because the leaders hold them down there. Sometimes, many times not consciously, but generally they, they hold stuff back because that's what, that's what guarantees their place. You find in the church that uh, uh, teachers will teach their congregations most of what they know, but not at all, not all, see. Because if they tell them all they know, then, then they've made themselves redundant. Uh, you find that uh, people in the ministry uh, will hold back very often some of the skills and some of the insights uh, because that, that, that always gives them a place. And leaders are tempted to, to do that. Now, I think the mark of the, of the true servant leader is he wants his people to know everything he knows, see. And his, his desire is to develop them, to empower them, to make them free and more autonomous, more self-governing uh, uh, day by day, see. I think that's a, that's a very, very important issue. Number three. The mark of servanthood is caring love for the, for the people they lead, caring love for the people they serve. So you find in Scripture that the biblical image of the leader as shepherd sort of slides in sometimes into the image of the leader as father. Because Father is the source of caring love. Fathering is, is love of the will towards his children. That's why Paul says you've got many instructors in Christ, but very few fathers. So leaders have to have a care for uh, the welfare of their, of their people. And, and caring love as far as leaders and people are concerned will include these concerns. Number one, that people have the proper facilities, the proper equipment, and the proper training to do the job they're supposed to do. Facilities, equipment, training. Number two, that attention is paid to their safety, health, welfare, and well-being their personal needs. Number three, endeavor is made to match the person with the, with the job. So the person gets fulfillment and satisfaction from what he does. Come back to the little diagram I drew in another context yesterday that everybody has a deposit of, of strength, God-given. We have strength. And we have limitations. Both God-given. Our strengths are, are to enable us to serve people. Our limitations are, are, are to leave a space in our life for other people to serve us. Now, if this uh, rectangle here represents a person's strength, this rectangle here 
can represent the job's requirements. The space in between here, where what the person is motivated to do and what the job requires to do, presents no difficulty for the leader. In fact, that's what gives a person his value for the job. He will never need to be motivated to do that part of his duties. Never, never need to be managed. He is self-motivating. He'll do that till the cows come home. Over here, however, you've got a problem because here are some things the job requires to be done and the person is not motivated to do it. Not that they can't do it, they are can-do skills, but they don't give him any satisfaction. Sorry, this one down here we're talking about. Things that the job requires the person to do and he's not motivated to do them. For example, this thing here may, in certain circumstances, involve uh, meeting a deadline. Now, anybody can meet a deadline. Everybody understands if something, something is to be done on Tuesday, everybody knows Tuesday, knows what day of the week it is, that's the deadline. Some people love meeting deadlines. I mean, if the things will be due on Tuesday, by Monday lunchtime, everything's tied up and stamped, and there it's on the desk, and, and they're off on next week's work. I can meet deadlines, but I very rarely do. I always struggle to meet deadlines, see, because I'm not motivated to do it, see. I don't understand how to do it. Now, these areas in a person's life are where they'll always fall short in their, in their performance. They'll never get a great deal of satisfaction from that, and that's where they're always liable, liable to be mediocre at best. The problem often is, you see, the last person in the job had no problems with that. They love meeting deadlines. So the boss said, well, the last girl I had doing this job never found me once. Why do you struggle with it? See, difference in motivation. See. So, so, so when, if, if you talk about management by exception, that's where the person needs to be managed. You may need to set up strategies or get some extra help to do that part of the job if you want to keep the person here for the value they get you, you they are to you for this area here. Over here, there's another area of dissatisfaction for a person. The person has things he wants to do, but there's no room for them in the job. And again, he'll do one of two things ultimately. Either he'll do that off the job, find that satisfaction elsewhere, or he'll shoehorn that into the job whether it belongs there or not. Now, if you've got a person, for example, who is an innovator, and you put him in a job that's running exactly the way you want it to, to run, he'll always insist on changing it. See, why? Because he's got an innovative, I need to change things, and you try to, find, try to push that into the job whether, whether it uh, applies or not. Now, <clears throat> this is the main source I discover of people's dissatisfaction with their jobs, things that they want to do and somehow they don't get a chance to do it. One of the things that uh, uh, had a fashion for a while, probably still has in, in the business, is what's called job enrichment. So there's a person who's dissatisfied with a job, give them more responsibilities. It's all right in theory, but if you don't know the person, you may add some more stuff on here extra things to do, again, they're not motivated to do. <coughs> so our, our care for the, for the person in terms of matching the person to the job has to take account of these things here. Now, we never get a perfect match, obviously, in this fallen world. But we have to remember that although you can change the job, the parameters of the job can be changed, you cannot change the shape of the person's motivation. And that is innate, they're born like that. And care for uh, people on the part of the leader is to recognize that the person, if they're going to find fulfillment in their job, there has to be uh, a good match between what the person is gifted to do and what they're required to do. Okay. Number four, every person is given encouragement, opportunity, and assistance to develop their potential and advance their chosen career. Everybody is given assistance and encouragement to understand what their potential is and to develop that potential. Number five, personal needs and concerns are not sacrificed to corporate goals. Care for the person is a care that his needs and his concerns are not sacrificed for the sake of corporate goals. 
Number six, everybody has opportunity to engage in work that will meet their financial needs and adequately reward skill and application, initiative. Everybody has a chance to be involved in work that will meet their financial needs and adequately reward skill and effort. And finally, when a person needs help, they can expect understanding, compassionate, and practical response from their leaders. When a person is in need, they can expect to get practical understanding and a compassionate response from their leaders. That's caring love. Something like that. All right, back to the essence of servanthood. Number four, there is a willing acceptance of obligation. Now, temperamentally, leaders do not like to be obligated. They like to be free, like other, other people to be obligated to them. Therefore, they're strong on commitment, but it's generally one-way commitment. That's why it is very hard, actually, to lead leaders. Ever noticed that? You'd think to get a bunch of leaders together very easy to lead because they understand all about leadership. Not so. Uh, it's very difficult to lead leaders. Now, servants have no, pro no problem with obligation or duty. That's the only way that they discover what they're supposed to do. So servanthood is not just accepting uh, uh, obligation, it's a willing acceptance of, of obligation. Number five, there is a desire for accountability. Not just a willingness to be accountable, but a desire to be accountable. Now, there are three terms, we'll come back to these this afternoon, but there are three terms that go together and we need to understand their difference. One is power. The second is authority. And the third is responsibility. And power, authority, and responsibility have to be equal. Power is the strength or the potency, if you like, to get your will done. Authority is the right to represent the power source and the right to exercise the prerogatives of power. Come back in more detail to that this afternoon. Responsibility is the accountability for results. Now you cannot give a person authority unless there is power to back up that authority. Otherwise it won't work. Authority is the right to represent the source of power. So if you give a person authority, you've got to have the power to back that authority up. You're no good giving a person power if they haven't got authority to use it. No good giving a person authority if there's no power to back it up. At the same time, it's dangerous to give a person power or authority without them being accountable for results. That's responsibility. And you can't hold a person accountable for results if they don't have the authority and the power to achieve those results. So power, authority, and responsibility go together. Now again, the natural bent of leaders is towards freedom and, and independence. It's difficult for them, well it's, it's, a, it's a, uh, a restriction uh, to them oftentimes to be accountable. That, that's a, a hindrance to their freedom of action. 
Now, a servant has no, no problem with accountability. That's the only way he discovers whether he's done a satisfactory job or not. He wants to be accountable. I remember in, uh, in our church in New Zealand uh, uh, one time, the brother who was in charge of administration, uh, very, very good at his job, very, very efficient man, but he and I always kind of rubbed each other up the wrong way, and I, I never understood why. I mean, off the job, fine, we got on fine, but as far as the, the job was concerned, there was always that, that uh, kind of uh, uh, some grit somewhere. Until I had a look at this guy's uh, motivations, and I discovered he had a strong need to be accountable, to be, to be uh, responsible to somebody. Now, my style was, was very kind of laid back. That's your job, Wayne, go and do it. If you want me, I'm here, but I'm not going to sit on your shoulder. See, now, he was, he was insecure, you see. He needed to be accountable. When I understood that, then I'd call in every week or so and, and get some reports and get some statements and find out what he was doing. Then we got on fine, see. Now, there was that, uh, that, that desire, that need for accountability. And I believe a, a person who has a true servant, the true servant wants to be accountable, see. Uh, he wants to spread out his, his books and show the results uh, uh, to, to, his, his, to the person in charge. Number six, there's a willingness to listen. Leaders are not good at listening. They're good at speaking and other people listen. A servant listens because that's the only way he knows what he's supposed to do. And a good indication of the of uh, a servant heart in, in leaders is the extent to which they're prepared to listen uh, to other people. We're going to talk. Uh, we're going to talk about the question of criticism later on. You know, I discover one of the, one of the uh, best ways to diffuse uh, the danger of, of taking personally criticism is to ask for it. And I believe uh, we should do that. Leaders should, should say to the people, look, if you can help me to make a better decision than I'm making, I want to hear from you. And uh, personally, I've been am amazed, I should not have been, but I've been amazed how responsible people come with the advice they give you. See. Uh, oftentimes, leaders are afraid of that. Or they also get all sorts of irresponsible criticism. But when you ask for it, people, in my experience, are very responsible about the suggestions they make, the way they make them, and so on. But to ask for criticism, to ask for advice, uh, is, a, is, a, is a very uh, very important thing. Amongst other things, because it is a way of honoring people. It's a way of honoring people. Now, honor is the recognition of worth and value. Honor and respect. See. Now, uh, oftentimes, the message that's communicated from leaders to people is, these are the decisions. Uh, you're not competent to understand those or discuss those. Now, they've, they've all been made, now just get on with the job. And people somehow feel dishonored, and rightly so. When you say to somebody, look, this is what we are proposing. I want to run it past you to get your ideas. What do you think? What do you honestly think about that? That person feels honored. See? And I think one of, the, one of the primary ways, and it's a very important aspect in managing people, in terms of respect uh, and honor, is to treat them as responsible people who've got something to con contribute. And where it's possible to allow them to share in the making of decisions that affect them. And if that's not possible, at least explaining to them the basis upon which decisions have been made uh, that affect them. Otherwise, we communicate uh, a highly dishonoring message and people are very sensitive towards that. The willingness to listen. Number seven, there is genuine humility of heart. And because of that, the ability to make sound judgments as to what we can do and what we can't do. In other words, there's a recognition of both our strengths and our limitations. We don't have to pretend to have strengths that we don't have. Now, a servant is always very very honest about what he can do and what he can't do. Why? Because he doesn't want to be shoved in a position to do something that he is unable to do. And finally, there's a willingness to share power with others. I've mentioned that before as far as redeemed power is concerned. 
the, the uh, servant, the, the leader with a servant heart wants to share power with others. As I said before, the more people who have power in an organization, the more power the organization has. Now I believe that, that the understanding of what's involved in servanthood is probably one of the most critical issues for leadership, Christian leadership today. And in the next session, we're going to take it out a bit further and discover how we get access to that. We need to know how to get access to redeemed power. We need to know how to get access to a servant heart.